Welcome, everyone. You can see lots of people joining here. I'm Sandra Reimer. I work with True Imagination on their communication. It's going to give everybody a minute or two to get in the webinar. This is week four. So glad to see so many of you returning again. And uh, in a few minutes here, I am going to have the president of True Imagination introduce our special guest this evening. Our president, as you probably know, is Audrey Vopetka. And um, we actually have something special coming up for Crew Imagination. It's our 50th anniversary in June. So uh, for those of you who are connected with our organization and taken a tour with us before, there's going to be lots of fun stuff for our anniversary. And for the rest of you, we have a great evening planned for you tonight. And uh, as I mentioned, Audrey Voth Petka is going to be introducing our guests shortly. Just want to give people enough time to get in the webinar. Great. Hello there. Almost time. Nice that uh, several of you are early. I always like early birds. It makes the uh, flow a little bit better. Hi there from Rhonda. That's um, a good point. If you would like to communicate with us and you have a question, you can either put it in the chat at the bottom or you can put it in the Q&A. I will come on after the presentation and I'll be reading out the questions and our special guest is going to uh, answer the questions. Uh, we have a question from John wondering um, how many people have been attending the webinars. Each time it's usually been between 130 and a few hundred and fifty or so people attending the webinars. That's so uh, really, uh, it's a good crowd. Okay. I think we will get started and others will join as they are able. So Audrey, why don't you come on and introduce our guest. Good evening, everyone. And as Sandra said, welcome to our fourth in the series of our virtual tour webinars. It's a beautiful evening here in Waterloo. And I trust it's the same all over North America and Canada, wherever you are. I'm pleased to know that so many of you continue to be interested in seeing and learning more about our Anabaptist and Mennonite museums, libraries, and archives. Our presenters and their teams appreciate your attentiveness and willingness to spend an hour with them each evening. Tonight's presenter is Jean Kilhefer Hess. Tour Imagination has been directly collaborating with Jean and her team at the Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society for almost three years now. Jean is a graduate of Messiah College in Grantham, Pennsylvania, and the Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Indiana. She is passionate about reflection that values the past, coupled with action to bring about a healthier world today. She brings a wide range of professional experiences to her role as the Executive Director of the Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. These include work in public accounting, as an entrepreneur, as a leadership consultant, and in nonprofit management. Jean has been conducting oral history interviews for almost 20 years and understands story as central to life. Welcome, Jean. Please feel free to start, Jean. I'm getting a message that I can't start my video. We can hear you. Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to be with you this evening. I've been looking forward to this time together for some time, and I hope for some good conversation at the end of the evening. 
Um, are you all able? Can I get some feedback whether my video is coming through? Yes, right. it's coming through. Perfect. I'll be using a variety of formats this evening, um, including eight PowerPoint slides interspersed among this eyeball to eyeball kind of conversation. And I'll start by telling you a little bit about Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society. I also have um, some show and tell later. So let's begin with Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society, which was um, organized in 1958. And sorry, let me just take a moment to get to what I want to share with you. Uh, working on it. Please bear with me. All right, here we are. Hmm. All right, well, sorry for the technical difficulties. We'll focus on the conversation and as it works, I'll pop up my slides. Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society, as I mentioned, was organized in 1958. The Mennonite Information Center formed the same year and focused on outreach to visitors, mostly tourists coming to Lancaster County. These two new organizations joined together in a newly built building in 1964. Today, they occupy neighboring buildings on the same campus along Route 30 in Lancaster and as of 2018 are joined together under the Historical Society. Mennonite Information Center offers a variety of ways to learn about Anabaptist life, including tours of the countryside featuring Amish and other plain groups. Guests can also experience a reproduction of the Hebrew tabernacle in the wilderness from the Old Testament. The Historical Society building offers a small but highly rated museum as well as our rich archives and research library. We have extensive family history resources there that serve both Mennonites and non-Mennonites. I heard a statistic relevant to mid 20th century America and I later requested and received confirmation on it that something like 40% of people in the United States have ancestral connections to Southeastern Pennsylvania. Maybe their ancestors settled here temporarily and then moved elsewhere, or some of them stayed, of course. Just south of Lancaster City, we have a museum that features a home built by the Mennonite family uh, with the name Her in 1719. And you'll hear a bit more about that later. The museum also offers the ability to experience an Eastern Woodlands Native American longhouse. And I'm going to try again here to get back to my PowerPoint because the visuals here really make a difference. We partner with a local nonprofit uh, focused on indigenous culture and education to ensure we're helping visitors understand that Mennonites came to a neighborhood that already existed. We feature what we know about Mennonite and native interaction in those early years. Here's a shot from the interior of the longhouse uh, looking up at the roof. In a typical year, Lancaster County hosts almost 9 million visitors who spend more than $2 billion here. In a typical year, we host 71,000 in-person visits across our locations, with the majority experiencing the biblical tabernacle. Many of our research resources are available online, and we host 33,000 online visitors, accessing 135,000 pages annually. Enough statistics. 
Our vision is diverse communities connecting across boundaries by knowing and valuing their own and each other's stories of life, faith, cultures, and histories. Our specific mission within that is focused on holding and sharing items and stories related to Lancaster Mennonites and interrelated communities. In a day and a time when there are lots of societal guide rails trying to separate us into groups and encouraging suspicion of the other, we jump those fences by learning and telling our, our own histories while carefully hearing and honoring the experiences of others. I'm interested in us thinking a little bit together this evening about the importance of accurate, useful, and relevant interpretation of history for today's audience. You'll find Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society among the endorsers of a movement called History Relevance, and you can learn more about them at historyrelevance.com. As stewards of Mennonite history, we offer historical artifacts and evidence to researchers for their learning. And those researchers interpret and create narratives to share. We offer several museum experiences, as I mentioned. And in those settings, it's our responsibility to engage a visitor with a meaningful interpretation of what they're experiencing related to the past. It's not enough to show something and say, look at this, isn't this cool, and move on. We have an opportunity to not only feature artifacts, but also tell stories and provide hands-on experiences that are faithful to historical evidence and demonstrate why history is relevant today. I'm gonna feature three artifacts from our collections to demonstrate how interpretation matters and how context matters. It can make all the difference between an engaging visit and a boring one, between factual information and someone's made up narrative because they're left entirely to imagine the details on their own, between respecting past lives by bringing context to the item or practice and judging the artifact or the people who used it with unrealistic 21st century assumptions. The first item that I'll be featuring this evening from our collection is called a diamond sampler quilt. <laughs> okay, I think I figured it out. This diamond sampler quilt was completed in 1860, likely by Fanny S. Booker, who lived 1841 to 1909. Yes, that would make her 19 years old when she completed this artistic masterpiece laid out in diamond in a diamond shapes format with 77 diamonds plus half diamonds along the edges. The diamonds are mostly pieced. There's a little applique. There's pink calico bands that frame each diamond and each is set off with green calico at the corners. There are as many as 122 pieces in a single diamond block. Incredibly tiny piecework. This quilt is among the most elaborate sampler quilts known and has been called the greatest quilt to have been made in Lancaster County. This quilt came to us from the collection of the late Clark E. Hess, who felt confident that the initials FSB, which are sewn in script on a piece of fabric and attached to the back of the quilt, are those of his great-great-grandmother, Fanny S. Booker. But I can do better than an image. Here, let me show you the quilt. Oh. Oh. 
One of the reasons Clark made the connection with Fanny S. Bucher is that a quilt he already had, which was made by his grandmother, Barbara Snyder, the daughter of Fanny, was a sampler quilt created in a similar vein. And you can see uh, this is the quilt created by Barbara Snyder, the daughter of Fanny. And this is the diamond sampler quilt that I'm featuring um, as my first item from the collection. There's Oh, and let me show you the. Here's FSB. There's so much more to learn about this quilt in order for it to be presented as not just a beautiful curiosity, but as something that tells a variety of stories about, about mid 19th century Mennonite life in Lancaster. I'm not gonna provide a very well-rounded interpretive experience here, but I'd like to point out that the experience of the person viewing or engaging with the piece matters immensely. And without additional knowledge or context, our brains that voraciously search for story simply fill in the blanks. In fall 2019, we featured this quilt in several in-person presentations, highlighting recent additions to our material culture collections. As someone who enjoys sewing myself, I was very interested. When I saw it up close and learned that Fanny's daughter Barbara had created a similarly themed quilt with many small pieces, I tried to think about what would lead someone to piece maybe up to 3,000 tiny pieces into a quilt. It's beautiful. It's been saved. What does it mean? Does it mean the creators were bored, unable to do other things that would normally fill the greater part of a day? Was it an obsession? Some genetic thing that caused two women to commit to such large projects? Was it camaraderie? Did the two quilts represent a special connection or maybe even a competition between mother and daughter. It's our job to fill in as much context as we know, and also to be very clear when we simply don't know the backstory. Clark has said in his documentation that the quilt was most likely created by his great-great-grandmother, and he gave the evidence that led him to that expectation, but it's not conclusive, and he says so. Most of us spent the last three months under stay-at-home orders, where the novel coronavirus turned typical daily routines upside down and time stretched on for many with few distractions. In such a context, I look at this quilt and think about the irrepressible creative urge of the artist's spirit, of the need to be productive and contribute something beautiful and functional to the world of a way to give fabric, which served an initial purpose, a new life. Likely any of these guesses may be part of a faithful interpretation, but I know the most central ingredient would be the life of the Lancaster Mennonite community and what expectations it had for women and what it welcomed from women in those days. This is something I would like to learn more about. Second item I'd like to feature uh, from our collection is the Her House itself. In the first years of the 18th century, a small group of Mennonite families left Europe and came to Pennsylvania, eventually buying land from William Penn in an area called Conestoga. After 
uh, one of those families, one of the her families was Christian and Anna Her, and they built what is now the oldest home in Lancaster County in 1719. Their house doubled as a Mennonite meeting house. And Christian's father, Hans, served as a bishop in the local area. The home is on a limestone bedrock foundation and is built from sandstone that was actually quarried on the property. The house is architecturally significant, but also represents a new to the hers sense of place. A place to start over, a sense of permanence, something that anyone who has ever moved and had to restart their life can relate to. For thousands of her descendants, the house is a sort of touchstone. But in an ever-changing world, this 300-year-old home still stands and offers a feeling of home and stability to anyone who walks through the door. It's been saved. It's restored beautifully. What does it mean today? I already mentioned that we're choosing to start the interpretive journey with guests by examining the Native American communities that called Lancaster home long before the hers did. Susquehannock, Lenape, Kanoi, and Conestoga Indians, among others. As we share about the Mennonite faith that provided inspiration for everyday living and caused this family so much trouble in Europe that they launched for America, we might ask visitors to consider such questions as, what does it mean to be a migrant? What does it mean to the identity of the person migrating and to the perception of others looking in? What does it mean to move into a new neighborhood? We have an opportunity to tell this story. So it's clear anyone who succeeded on what is sometimes called the frontier got a lot of help rather than lean on that old American saw of self-reliance. And finally, a sidebar online in one of the well-known national newspapers that touted recipes using asafoetida took me immediately to another item in our collection and a personal story shared by our archivist and librarian, Steve Ness. Asafoetida is the dried resin from an herb in the same family as celery. It has a strong odor and a bitter taste before being cooked. It's also called hing, and it's used in the cuisine of Northern India. Steve says, when I was growing up, I enjoyed hearing my grandfather, my mother's father, tell stories or recite poems or sing songs from his growing up years. Once during reminiscing, he talked about the practice of wearing a small bag or pouch on a string around his neck that was supposed to help to keep him healthy during the winter time. The only other detail he provided was that his parents would smear a kind of foul smelling paste in the pouch that he called a fittity bag. My interest was piqued and I began casually looking into what a fittity bag might have been. Somehow I stumbled on the term asafitida at work and realized that fittity and asafitida or asafitity were the same thing. I learned that asafoetida has been used in a number of folk medicine traditions to ward off everything from the common cold to the Spanish flu. I heard my grandfather tell this story. I heard him talk about the smell. I read of other people telling similar stories. I had not, however, ever seen an asafoetida bag, not even a photograph. Given how these bags were used, it's certainly understandable that most of them were discarded. My grandfather's stories that I heard became much richer when I saw these fittity bags. You might be interested to know that the information we have on these bags is that one of them, it seems, was never used. The other is indicated as, quote, brown plaid fabric sewn shut with contents still inside, unquote. Steve needed to open up the frame in order to do some maintenance. He said he couldn't resist the urge to sniff the bag with quote unquote contents. He reported no detectable odor. Last fall when we held several events where we featured these bags, these artifacts seemed interesting to me in the sense of a general human interest 
story and in the sense of understanding more about what people in our area understood about health and depended on in everyday life. Again, now just eight months later, and still in the early stages of experiencing life in league with a newly emerged virus that has become a worldwide pandemic, I connect differently with the idea of individuals trying to keep themselves and their loved ones healthy when they're not sure exactly what causes an illness. After conclusive research has been done and independently confirmed, as we look back, we may chuckle at ourselves, at some of our assumptions and our behavior. But that's not really the point. These asafitida bags represent people doing their very best to care for themselves and their loved ones using the resources and information they have. Having just been through a period of incredibly high uncertainty, we can likely recognize the psychological comfort of having something tucked close to your heart that reminds you that someone cares or that you're being potentially protected from harm. These kinds of interpretive links can then lead to asking a visitor that may not only be interested, may lead to asking a visitor questions that may not only be interesting, but also spark beneficial reflection on today's world and how to contribute to community care today. Research, interpretation, context, relevance to today. These are the key responsibilities of a history organization as it engages with those seeking to learn about, learn from, and enjoy the past today. That concludes my presentation, but as I wrap up, I wanna say a special thanks to Audrey and Tour Imagination for inspiring and organizing this series. Tour Imagination generously partners with Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society, as Audrey mentioned, in sponsoring our robust calendar of events and in a variety of ways. Yes, 2020 is playing out differently than expected, but I encourage you to examine what tour, made, tour imagination has to offer. Their heritage tours are unforgettable immersive experiences. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, that was awesome. Um, I really especially enjoyed uh, how you present more than one heritage story in your um, collection of sites, including the Indigenous story. You know, is that unique to your center, presenting the Indigenous perspective like that? Um, say a little bit more about the question. Um, so, do other Mennonite historical centers also partner with uh, Indigenous organizations to present that side of the story or that piece of the story? That's a great question. I would love to, um, to learn if there are other Mennonite history organizations partnering in that way. I'm not aware of any personally, but it, it may be happening. That's terrific. Um, so if you would like to submit a question in the chat, you are welcome to do that. And as I mentioned, I will be reading those out to Jean. We're going to take questions for about 10 or 12 minutes. And um, yeah, if you, and then in a follow-up email, we will be giving you an opportunity to connect with Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society. I see a question coming in. Uh, this is from Irene. I'm working on some early Mennonite genealogy. Please elaborate on any resources that you have that may help with this research. So is that something maybe you can give a brief overview of, but then we can um, send out with links in the follow-up email? Absolutely. Um, we have a well-known and extensive um, research library that specifically benefits genealogy researchers. So we would love to assist you in your research. Uh, there are lots of options and information online, but I'll just highlight briefly um, from some of our information, what we have available. Um, a genealogical card file containing data on hundreds of thousands of families. Mm -hmm. And these cards have actually uh, also been submitted and uploaded through Ancestry.com, so many folks um, get connected with them there. We have more than 3,000 uh, published genealogies. We have many um, unpublished genealogies and historical resources as well. Um, we have more than 2,500 cem cemetery transcriptions, so that just gives you um, 
a little glimpse into the range of things we offer regarding genealogy. We also have um, research services available. So if there are items that aren't available online but are in our um, archives or library, you could reach out to our staff and they can provide research services for you uh, for a fee. Okay. Fantastic. So we have a question from uh, Julia Booker, wondering were Fanny Booker's parents from the Clay Township area in Northern Lancaster County? I believe that's the case, yes. Let's see. Julia, maybe you're a relative. <laughs> yes, I'm virtually certain that's the case, but I, I wouldn't claim to be the final word. Okay, she's thinking maybe she is a relative. That's great. Uh, okay, Valerie is saying Pennsylvania Mennonite history is a favorite of mine. Journal, she means the journal. Pennsylvania, you know that um, journal, Pennsylvania Mennonite history? Okay. Yeah, so Pennsylvania Mennonite Heritage is our quarterly journal and it goes out to all of our members. Our members hail from across the US and also uh, we have some in Canada and some internationally. And Pennsylvania Mennonite Heritage is, um, it features family history, it features local history, Mennonite history more generally. Uh, we every quarter have a feature on that's Pennsylvania German. So there's the translation and also the local Pennsylvania German um, language, usually telling a story or sometimes it's a transcription of an audio interview. So it's designed as um, a piece that's kind of sometimes more academic, but often um, more for popular historians who are doing their work and sharing it with others. Perfect. We have uh, a question uh, from Mary. How did you come to want to include the indigenous side of history? Can you describe more about how you accomplished that? Yeah, so I've been in this role for two years. So I'll just give you my impression of how that started. That was um, an effort that was in the 2011 to 2000, 2013 period when initially there was an interest in broadening the story that we tell by connecting with the indigenous community. And I believe it came out of a local effort uh, called Honor and Healing. And it was a number of Mennonite as well as other um, Christian denominational folks meeting with local native people. And there was actually a healing, an honor and healing service where there was um, an apology for, for the difficult and uh, difficult things and the atrocities that happened um, early on when European folks came to this area. Out of that effort then was an interest in helping to um, walk alongside our native um, neighbors and allow their history to be visible as we tell our own story. And mm -hmm. so the reproduction of the Native American Longhouse was accomplished and it's based on um, actually excavation of a local Native American community. That's fantastic. Wow. We have a question here from Sue. She is wondering, a lot of archives are being digitized. How much do you do this at your center? Are you digitizing a lot of your resources? It's always in process. And there is uh, quite, quite a number of resources available. Our, our archivist and librarian, Steve Ness, uh, who you can reach at library at lmhs.org would have more details. I think we have quite a ways to go, but we also do have quite a few things available. And as I mentioned, specifically our genealogical card file index, we partnered with ancestry.com um, to make that available more broadly. So there may be opportunities for additional partnerships in the future. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Um, I, uh, you may or may not know that the um, quarters for True Imagination is in Waterloo, in Ontario, and I myself um, in Eastern Ontario, which was Eby Town. And um, our town, our city, was founded by Benjamin Eby, who was from Lancaster area. And so we have um, we have a wonderful. Uh, Mennonite culture here and still there are surviving things where um, so much of what happened there in Pennsylvania 
seated wonderful things happening here I, I also want to highlight just briefly, I have a colleague who teaches at a local state university and she is, she's not Mennonite, but she's very focused on this idea that when Mennonites came to early Pennsylvania, they actually helped to form the best of what became um, American values in the sense of um, recognizing your neighbor as someone who you need to listen to and care about. Um, she suggests that Mennonites were some of the earliest to practice philanthropy, that in Europe, um, giving away your money was not a common practice, but Mennonites said, you know, I, I care about the others in my community and I want to share what I have. So it's just fascinating um, thinking about the broader stories that we can tell, um, especially at our Her House Museum regarding early America. Yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, any final questions before we wrap things up? Otherwise, uh, I'm going to thank you so much, Jean. That was fantastic. And uh, just especially enjoyed hearing your message about um, hearing all stories, that it's important to tell the Mennonite historical story, but also hearing all stories. And uh, boy, we could sure use some Mennonite peace all over the world right, in, right about now. Oh, one quick uh, question. Have come in. You partner with Young Center at E Town College. This is from Valerie. We do. They're good friends, colleagues, and partners. For those who don't know, what um, what is E Town? Elizabeth Town College is a local um, school that was started by the Church of the Brethren, and the Young Center is focused on. Um, Pietist and Anabaptist uh, studies. Great. And then Larry says, Waterloo, Ontario was founded by John Herb from Lancaster and a whole herb group in Ontario are from Lancaster. So not just Kitchener with Benjamin Eby, but John Herb as well. We have a lot to be thankful for from Pennsylvania. <laughs> Thank you again, Jean. Oh, sorry. These are the last two questions we'll take. And I quickly slide in, this in, Dora says, given all that's in the news, was there any early relationships with blacks or slaves in Pennsylvania with Mennonites? A wonderful uh, question that requires more research. At least I personally don't have what I need to answer that question, but yeah, I think it is an important question to look beyond uh, the Mennonite native connection and look at other communities as well in the early years. Yeah. And then Becky, this is the last question. She says, are there a lot of old order Mennonites in Pennsylvania and did they have any significant interactions with the Amish in the area? Yes, uh, we have many old order Mennonite uh, communities and often those folks live right alongside their Amish neighbors and the rest of us. So yeah, they're great interactions. We also have um, important contributions to Lancaster Mennonite Historical Society from our old order brothers and sisters. So. Great, thank you again. Hope to see everyone back next week and we'll be sending out a follow-up email so you can connect with Lancaster Historical Society. Thank you, good night. Bye now.